how to implement ISO 27001 Annex A 8.18 Privileged Utility Programs. So my name is Stuart Barker, author of the Ultimate ISO 27001 Toolkit. And we're going to take a little look through uh, this particular technical control, how you can implement it and some of the gotchas uh, when it comes to it. There is a blog uh, with a lot more detail in, so have a look uh, in the description associated with the video and you're going to get a lot more information on this. But covering off what are we looking at here, we're looking at the risk that privileged utility programs um, can create risks for us, right? Usually these are programs that have uh, power, uh, they have the ability to alter settings, to take control of systems, to change systems in such a way that it can represent a risk for us. So what the standard is saying is, is understand if you need these privileged utility programs, understand what they are, control them, uh, and try and mitigate the risks of things going wrong in your environment. If I was going to look at things, what do I mean by a privileged utility program? Right, These are things that are going to be baked into the software, baked into the operating system that make your life easier in some instances or provide you with some level of control. So let's think. We've got uh, examples in here. We've got antivirus software, malware protection tools, patching tools, backup software, coding tools, network management and monitoring tools. So these are usually tools that are required by a professional um, within your organization to do something as part of their job. But if they are in the wrong hands or they're provided to the wrong person, then clearly they can allow them to, 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 to do actions that are going to be nefarious uh, and get you in a lot of hot water. If I was going to read out what the standard said, I am, uh, just so you know what it is that we're trying to do. So the use of utility programs that can be capable of overriding system and application controls should be restricted and tightly controlled. So how would I approach this? What I would do is, as part of my uh, inventory, when I'm doing my asset inventory, when I'm understanding what assets I've got, part of that is going to be around software. Software uh, and utility programs usually fall under that category, right? So as an organization, I want to have a list of the utility programs that, that we allow. What are, the, what are the tools that we need to do our job? We're speaking to our coding teams, we're speaking to our network management teams and our technical teams, because we never want to prevent people from doing their job. We wanna have a list of what those programs are. We wanna understand the capabilities of those programs, why we've got them, uh, what those programs can do, what are the risks that are associated with those. So in very basic terms, I would have a list of uh, approved uh, utility programs. And then it depends on whether or not you want to go belts and braces, right? If you want to go belts and braces, clearly we're going to put in place uh, an approval process. So we're going to put in there, as we would with access to systems, some kind of a process that documents uh, people's requirement to have the tools. Uh, it's going to have an approval process within it. The person that makes the request for the tool won't be the person that approves the use of the tool. So we're going to have segregation of duty to remove that conflict of inter interest. And we're going to have, therefore, a record of who it is that has what. Considerations that you might put in there is, again, depending on the environment that you're in, you might want that approval to last only for a certain amount of time. It may be the case that you don't want these utility programs in your environment full time. So it could be that it's an on-demand requirement, uh, or it could be that you set uh, default limits and where people have to re-request authorization to them. So that's gonna be your basic control, right? We have a list of what it is that we allow, and then we have an approval process where people can request those applications to be installed, and we put some kind of a time layer on it so that we remove them at the end. It may be the case that you want to perform a risk assessment against those tools. So you might want to be looking at bringing in your experts, the people who understand the tools and the privileged utility programs, and then looking at things like forums and looking at 5.7, your threat intelligence to understand what the risks are associated with that. And then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be placing in compensating controls. Now, what are compensating controls? Compensating controls are controls that help to mitigate the risk, right? They're support controls. So we may, for example, have in here that uh, users don't have administrative access to devices by default, right? So that is a good compensating control. To get an administrative access to a device, you require some level of approval, some level of authorization, uh, and there is some level of access control. The benefit of doing that means that even if people are able to download these tools into your environment, they can't run them without following your structure and without following your process. 
Other compensating controls would include monitoring, monitoring and alerting, understanding in your environment what monitoring you are doing so that you can pick up things like unusual activity. You may have endpoint device management whereby endpoints are configured and when uh, an alteration to an endpoint uh, occurs, based on thresholds and limits, it generates some kind of an alert back to you so that you can do an investigation. So where we have our primary control, we have our primary control of restricting utility programs to the only people that need it, having that authorization process. We also make reference to the other Annex A controls that we know that we've got that can help mitigate if those programs make their way into our environment. We're going to have configuration management where we've locked down the ports and services of devices uh, by default uh, in our default environment. Uh, and we're going to have other compensating controls that go around that. So this isn't one to worry about. It's about very, very basic management. It's about understanding what your organization needs. It's understanding if you need coding tools, uh, if you need these network management tools, if you're running host intrusion, network intrusion tools, that the right people have the right tools to do their job. But there is some level of control around it so that not any Tom, Dick or Harry can deploy these into your environment and start to create um, all kinds of problems and all kinds of risks for you. So a nice, easy one for you to follow. When it comes to your external audit, the things that the auditor is going to look for, as always, is going to be documentation. So do we have a documented list of approved utility and privilege programs in our environment? Then they're going to be looking at how you've implemented that. Do you have that authorization process? Can you evidence that level of authorization process? And it's potentially the case that they're going to look at the compensating controls that you've got that prevent people from downloading free utility programs, free software into your environment and what controls you've got in place for if that does happen about how you can identify that, how you can deal with that and how you can minimise the damage of that happening. They're also going to want to make sure that you've done internal audits, as always. So evidence that at least once within the cycle, you've conducted an audit of this. And they may look at technical controls that you've put in place. If you have things like endpoint device management, configuration management, they may want to see how those tools are configured and how you are using them to prevent the use of utility programs. Not a particularly hard one. There is a blog that's associated with it. Click within the description to get access to that. Um, but my name is Stuart Barker, author of the Ultimate ISO 27001 Toolkit, and we're working our way through the Annex A controls.